Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Pushpak Bhattacharya, who's a professor of computer science and engineering at IIT Bombay. He's a fellow of National Academy of Engineering, uh, Abdul Kalam National Fellow and distinguished alumnus at the IIT Karakpur. He's the former director of IIT Patna, Vijay and Sita Washi Chair, Professor IIT Bombay, and VP Elect VP President of Association of Computational Linguistics. Currently, he holds additional responsibility of Professor in Charge, World Class Research Lab, Data and Information Sciences under the Institute of Eminence, IIT Bombay. Professor Bhattacharya's research areas are natural language processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. His lab, called Center for Indian Language Technology at IIT Bombay, is known internationally for its contribution to NLP and machine learning. Professor Bhattacharya has published more than 350 research papers in different areas of NLP and ML. He's the author of Machine Translation, Cognitively Inspired Natural Language Processing, and Investigation Based on Eye Tracking, and Low Resource Machine Learning Translation and Transliteration. So, Professor, really appreciate you taking time and being part of a humble podcast. Why don't we start with explaining the difference between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing, what you've been working on? Okay, so first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to this forum. And uh, I see that you are trying to disseminate the knowledge of AI widely amongst common people, which is a very laudable endeavor. And I'm definitely, uh, you know, very appreciative, appreciative of this effort. So now uh, coming to this question of difference between AI, machine learning, natural language processing, my area is natural language processing. I have been uh, involved in what is called uh, three generations of natural language processing, where uh, the first generation is based on human understanding of the task and language phenomena. So such systems are created by making rules. So for example, you want to translate from, let's say English to Hindi, then one would sit down and write uh, rules that in English, the verb is in the middle, but in Hindi, the verb should go to the end of the sentence. So that's a rule. So those kind of rules should get created and uh, such rules are innumerable in number. So it is very difficult to create so many rules. It is not really scalable. So next came uh, the age of uh, statistical machine learning based natural language processing. So in that stage, we saw that uh, the power of data was being harnessed through machine learning. So that's how natural language processing and machine learning uh, became very close to each other. Machine learning started choosing uh, very challenging problems from natural language processing. And natural language processing got powerful techniques from machine learning. That was the synergy. Now, still there was uh, human intervention required for statistical machine learning based systems, which uh, gave rise to deep learning based systems. As data becomes more and more, statistical machine learning begins to yield ground to deep learning in the sense that deep learning based systems get more and more accurate. So in machine translation, we see that most of the systems now are completely deep learning based. So I've seen all these three generations of natural language processing. And from this description of mine, it must be quite clear that um, while natural language processing is concerned with solving a real life problem which impacts life and society of human beings, and which is grounded on language, for example, creating a chat, chat bot, which will do airlines reservation. So that's a very real need and it requires natural language processing. But uh, natural language processing uh, appeals to machine learning for providing powerful techniques. So that is the difference between natural language processing and machine learning. Natural language processing is problem centric, machine learning is technique centric and they sort of synergize with each other. Now, what is the difference between AI and uh, these two fields? Natural language processing and machine learning are two branches of artificial intelligence because both of them both these fields want to make machines more intelligent so that's why artificial intelligence so if the question is then uh, what are the other areas in ai which are different from nlp and machine learning computer vision speech processing robotics these would be uh, other areas so ai is a much bigger umbrella machine learning and nlp are parts of ai that would be the difference 
I, I think so far, uh, the entire AI uh, field was in a very linear growth space. But I, I think the last few years, because of the compute capability, there are some exciting things happening in, in, with the space of AI. You are the head uh, at the Natural Language, uh, Language Processing Research Group Center for Indian Language Technology Lab at IIT Bombay. So can you share some of your works at the CFILT lab? So this lab, uh, I may say, was set up in 2000 when we received a generous grant from ministry, but our natural language processing research preceded the setting up of that lab. In fact, in 1996, we got a reasonably uh, you know, handsome grant from United Nations University, which is under the control of United Nations. The goal of that project was very ambitious. It was to create a platform where 15 uh, languages of the world would uh, have their uh, translation done through a kind of intermediate representation. So that intermediate representation is called UNL, Universal Networking Language. So while working on UNL, we understood that uh, representation of meanings of words is very important. So we created what is called the Indo word, Indian language word nets, which are very le rich lexical resources connected with each other. Hindi is the pivot language there, which means that all the word meanings are linked with word meanings of Hindi. To give an example, let's say uh, I have the concept of water, which is expressed by Pani in Hindi. Now, the word Pani is ambiguous. There are many senses of Pani, but when Pani is associated with different synonyms of Pani in the sense of water, we get a unique meaning. This is called a synset. So what we did was we linked the synsets of other languages with Hindi, and thereby we create a, a structure of 18 Indian languages, which is extremely rich in meaning. So that was our first major work. This is in the area of what is called lexical semantics. Then we got a grant from Government of India, Ministry of IT uh, for machine translation from Marathi to English to Hindi. So these three languages have always been on, in our focus, English, Hindi, and Marathi. So we became part of a national effort on translation involving Marathi, Hindi, and English. And we created you know, a number of uh, systems based on statistical machine translation. So at the same time, Government of India also made me the national coordinator of Indian language search engine technology. So that was called Sandhan. Sandhan means search. So we created a search system for uh, Indian languages which would be taking queries in Indian language and then retrieving information in that language plus Hindi plus English. So this was what is called our cross-lingual information access project, large government of India project. We created Sandhan and this was released in 2012. So WordNet, uh, Indian language machine translation, cross-lingual information access, these were very large projects you know, involving you know, crores and crores of rupees. We also have been working with many top industries. For example, with IBM, we have been working on sentiment analysis, then um, explainability, and again, you know, sp some specific kind of machine translation. Then uh, uh, question answering, those have been our work. With uh, Samsung, LG, Accenture, we have been working on uh, many areas information extraction, conversational AI, and so on. And then recently uh, through a fellowship of mine, which is very prestigious, it's called Abdul Kalam Fellowship. We have been working with uh, a company called Scribe Tech. They're in the medical NLP domain. So where we are creating a system which will assist radiologists to, to generate the uh, report of a patient from X-rays and then um, uh, MRI, CT scan, all these reports. So this increases the productivity of the radiologist. Then there is something called imprint, which is a joint project of Ministry of Education and another ministry. And in, in our case, we are uh, co collaborating with um, Honeywell to create knowledge graph and deep learning based question answering system for aviation domain, accident reports, uh, user manuals, and so on. So these question answering systems are high accuracy. 
because they use domain knowledge as well as deep learning systems. And then before that, we worked on financial analytics, cricket commentary, information extraction. There were multiple projects, huge number of you know projects and a lot of work in NLP. Would you like to shine light on explainability? Because I mean, you know, with these yeah. AI systems, you know, it, it's very difficult to kind of actually understand with the, especially, you know, these data hungry uh, uh, models, what goes behind at the back end. So could you, you yeah. know, shine light on your research with the, the explainability yes, yes. AI? So explainability is becoming very, very important and has assumed a lot of importance. That is mainly because suppose I have uh, a translation output from a deep learning based system and the translation is not, uh, not what it should be. So there are two parameters by which translations are adjudged. One is called fluency. The output should be syntactically correct, idiomatic. And the other parameter is called adequacy. So whatever information is there in the source sentence should be faithfully captured in the target sentence. So those, uh, you know, uh, whenever there is a problem in the output, we do not know what to do. Which parameter in the deep learning system shall we change? Because there are millions of parameters. You mentioned large language model. This problem is all the more acute in case of large language models. How do you explain these results? So we have been working on explainability using you know, traditional mechanisms like uh, LIME, integrated gradient, then relevance back propagation, all those you know, well-tested ideas in explainability have been with us. But uh, we have introduced some <clears throat> interesting ideas here. For example, when uh, data is annotated by annotators, where do their eyes go rest? You know, those are the points of interest. So if you have generated an output from a machine and you ask an evaluator to see the quality, the evaluator looks at the output and then at different points, the eye rests, signifying that these are the points where we should look for explainability. So cognitive natural language processing, eye tracking based clues, these we have introduced into explainability research. My PhD student, Kevin, had a part of his PhD devoted to this task. So explainability is uh, very accurately needed. And in fact, uh, explainability right now captures mainly correlation, output and input parts uh, capture correlation. But we have to go towards causality. For example, people in bioinformatics, they want to, they are not sa have satisfied only with correlation. They want to know what is the cause of a particular symptom. What is the cause of a particular disease? What is the effect of a particular medicine? So while in on one hand, there is a big force operate, make, making the models larger and larger and making them more and more powerful, there is also this critical need of the attempt to explain those models. But this is really a very, very tall task because these large models have billions and billions of parameters. It's very difficult. It has completely transformed, you know, I mean, just maybe a couple of decades back, we, we, we didn't have internet connectivity and then Google uh, and then Geo came in and created this huge transformation by giving data so cheap that today almost, you know, everybody's got a pocket, a computer in a pocket, you know, you, the, the Thela Wala to the, 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 the entrepreneur to, you know, the, the, the buy in your house, Every, everybody's got a, a computer in their pocket and what that's done is that it's kind of democratized knowledge it's given accessibility of knowledge of what's happening around the world you know given us the tool through which we can buy sell uh, reach out to people communicate and and so on and so forth in that process what we've been doing is that our, our, our data consumption has gone higher we've been uh, consuming so much data we've been creating so much data so in a country of 1.3 billion people I i'm sure in the next few years the kind of data that we we're going to be collecting is going to be completely completely humongous how is that data being leveraged and, and do you think that in the coming years we could someday be able to build these large language models, a transformer based large language models in the lines of GPT-3 uh, and, and BERT? Very good question, I would say. Because with so much of data, we should also be able to create large uh, language models. By the way, so there is this model called Moodle, which was created by Google. 
And this is a multilingual large model, and they have made it completely open source, which is a very nice contribution to the NLP of Indian languages. Uh, Professor Partha Talukar uh, from ISC Bangalore and also Google Research has been instrumental in creating this large language model, which is helping Indian language processing quite a lot. So now, uh, with uh, so much of data and so much of you know opportunity, we should be creating large language models. But as I said, you know, explainability is becoming really a a uh, a very critical necessity. We do, do not know what these large language models are doing. So while you know all these uh, big industries, you know, Google, IBM, Microsoft, uh, Facebook they would create you know, very large language models because of the huge computing power and very huge uh, amount of data. So, and also, fortunately, they are releasing these uh, large language models to, for research. We would, uh, I mean, we would like to devote our attention to this kind of large language models, but we would also like to solve very difficult problems like explainability, uh, sentiment, emotion handling, then uh, doing reasoning, doing inferencing. So when, if to, the answer to your question, when will India create these large language models? We would first like to you know, uh, devote our attention to problems around large language models, which are now crying for attention. Okay? So we'd like to solve that. And uh, Mural is a good effort, which is uh, totally be coming from India. And I'm sure such, uh, such large language models will get created more and more large, larger and larger models will get created. So recently Nandan Nilakani launched the National Language Translation Mission India, uh, which is run by AI for Bharat. Would you like to share your views on that? You know, I was recently in IIT Madras where uh, Nandan Nilakani, uh, Nilakani Center for Data Science was inaugurated. So AI for Bharat is a startup company uh, which is uh, led by my student Mitesh Khapra, Anup Punchaputan, and Pratyush Kumar. And Mitesh and Anup are my PhD students. They have also received huge grant from Ministry of IT to create data for NLP speech systems. So such efforts will proliferate. There will be many such efforts, many such entities in India because of the data potential that the country has. So uh, those are very rosy pictures for the country. And yes, whatever I can do, for the advancement of these causes, I do. Right. Yeah. So, can you share something that you're working on currently? And how, you know, obviously you shared earlier, I mean, in the course of conversations, you know, the applications of, of AI, ML, and NLP. Could could you talk a little bit more in depth about, you know, the the, uh, the applications that could create complete social transformation here in India? Yeah? Okay, so let me talk about almost quite a few of our res res uh, current research. One is we are part of this uh, uh, National Language Technology Mission of Ministry of uh, Electronics and IT, MAT. So we are part of this Bhashini project where we have to create speech to speech machine transition. And our labs uh, languages are English, Marathi, Hindi, as usual, which has been the case for a long time. But now uh, I'm coordinating two other large consortia. One is called Vidyapati. So in this Vidyapati consortium, we are translating from Hindi and back to Bengali, Konkani, Marathi, and Maithili. Maithili is one of the low resource languages. It is close to Bengali and Hindi both. And the name is called Vidyapati uh, after the celebrated poet Vidyapati of Maithili. And then another project is uh, consortium is Ishan. This involves languages from Northeast, Manipuri, Assamese, Bodo, and Nepali. Here, we uh, our goal is to create uh, back and forth translation between uh, English, Assamese, Bodo, Nepali, and Manipuri. And this is a challenging task because these languages, Manipuri, Bodo, they are from Tibeto Burman family. They have very interesting and complex properties. So for example, in Manipuri, we have to segment the word into small morphemes after which the NLP can be done. So this is one large project and this is socially very imp impactful because this will now bring some of these languages which are low resource and not really attended to. Um, so so uh, people of people using those languages will come under the umbrella of NLP and 
get the blessings of natural language processing technology. Then we are also working on this imprint project, as I said, for high accuracy question answering system. This is a live project going on. We are working on uh, productivity improvement of uh, radiologists. Then uh, we have, uh, have been working on uh, finding the bias in movies. Okay. Uh, so we are developing techniques to identify biases. Then uh, automatic natural language uh, generation. And that is giving rise to automatic generation of scripts and movie plots. So this is with Eros now, which is a very well-known movie production house. Bias detection is also with uh, one of the top industries. Then uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, is Professor Partha Talukdar and me have been jointly guiding a student for uh, universal morphology analyzer creators. So that will facilitate NLP of many, many languages together because we'll have one single neural network with morphology analysis of multiple languages. So all these, langu all these uh, tasks are extremely socially relevant because they benefit uh, conversational AI, namely chatbot industry. They benefit translation industry. They benefit question answering industry, uh, opinion mining, sentiment and emotional analysis. All these areas are benefited, which affect, which impact life in society at large. Right. I, I think the world in the next 10 years is going to get completely transformed. Possibly, I mean, you know, we will have these uh, uh, glasses, these wearables, AR, VR glasses. And, and with that, it possibly maybe the, the person who's kind of speaking in a different language will be able to translate exactly and we'll be able to understand uh, that, that, that language. So it, we're getting into a world, possibly languages itself. I mean, you won't, the, the barrier of language will not exist. Plus, you mentioned about those, you know, these movies where you, you could do auto translation and for the use of radiology, uh, Cure AI is doing some fantastic, uh, you know, things with that. So, yes, I think we're just exploring the these real world use cases or, or benefits of, of uh, AI. Uh, obviously, there, there'll be like lots of pros which will be loaded on, uh, you know, the, the applications of AI and obviously a, a few cons also because eventually i guess we'll work, get into a world where you know automation will be there and automation though it will create a lot of jobs also because people like to say that you know when automation happens you know there'll be like a lot of job loss but i think you know automation there'll be a lot of jobs which will be created and i think that's the case right now because i think we've gotten into a world where there is more and more demand for data science and and and, and so on, all these other fields you know but there's lack of those people with those skills but, but Talk about that, you know, I mean, uh, uh, is India preparing for those fields where we are uh, uh, pushing the education uh, in that direction where where the students are directed to, you know, being ready for the future rather than, you know, the old way of learning? Yeah, so, uh, you know, on education, I have, uh, you know, a few, uh, few important idea, ideas or important beliefs, okay, which are, uh, which I have uh, seen are effective in the long run, okay, based on many years of being in education, teaching, research. So, so you mentioned uh, the issue of reskilling. There will be uh, job creation, which will demand uh, new skills from people. Now, of course, I was mentioning our work, I should have men mentioned also a very recent NDA work called uh, uh, Conversational AI Center, which was uh, created in IIT Bombay by signing an MOU between Gupshap and CMINES, Center for Machine Intelligence and Data Science, newly created in IIT Bombay. So I'm also part of that. So, you know, those NDA works require people with a completely different kind of skill. Also, we interestingly note that uh, there is less and less of programming. So OpenAI's codec system, for example, generates Python code from natural language with very high accuracy in no time. So what is happening then? Is the, is the need for pro programmers reducing? Indeed, indeed, it is so. So on the other hand, there is need for very high quality, high expertise data annotators who have deep insight into linguistics, 
the deep understanding of the task involved. So this this segment is is increasing like uh, you know never before. And for our problem, for example, we need lots of annotators who can create conversational AI data, machine translation data. We need lots of evaluators who will see the output of the machine. So while uh, the need for programmers job, the need for traditional way of computing is reducing, the need for data science, which will assist AI and computing, that is ever increasing. You know, we, we need those kind of people quite a lot. Now, are we preparing students at the school level, college level, university level for those kind of tasks? So let us see. Now, uh, when we have to, uh, for, for example, evaluate machine translation output, let's say from language L1 to language 2, let's say from Hindi to English, definitely we need a very good command of English itself. English to Hindi, we need very good Hindi speak. Uh, people who are very well, you know, uh, conversant with Hindi have good insight into language phenomena and so on. So uh, the humanistic education, education which is uh, emphasizing humanity subjects is becoming more and more important. What is the reason? The reason is we are asking the machine to become like humans, to take up jobs which human beings are doing. So hum educa humanistic education is uh, becoming important and I think there is a good emphasis in the direction in our education system. But I am also a man who, you know, is very keen on foundations. So fundamentals have to be strong. For example, in AI, we need probability very strongly. We need linear algebra very well. So these subjects like optimization, linear algebra, probability, they have to be taught very well. And they're indeed, there are excellent courses from IITs, IISCs, which are also available on NPTEL platform, SOAM platform. And the students are well advised, really well advised to acquire these techniques, these understandings very well. At the same time, for NLP, at least since I know this field to an extent, understanding linguistics, understanding literature, understanding how people speak, understanding semantics, pragmatics, understanding phonology, phonetics are becoming more and more important. And those kind of courses are coming. For example, I teach two courses in IIT Bombay the first level basic course on NLP and then another course on deep learning for NLP, which is more advanced. The first one is concept based. The second one is more technique based. So there I you know, try to cover uh, foundations of uh, probability along with the natural language processing along with machine learning models. So this kind of education is the need of the hour and uh, educational institutes are doing whatever they can, but more, much more is needed. Definitely. So here I'd like to summarize this point saying that uh, all these uh, mathematical uh, fields are very important, linear algebra, optimization, probability I mentioned already. At the same time, education, which is based on humanity courses, linguistics, for example, uh, psychology, because we have to uh, track, um, you have to solve emotion and sentiment based problems. Um, so uh, logic, so they also have to be emphasized. COVID has completely changed the game. The entire education industry has been upended. Till COVID, I think, you know, we were all okay with the brick and mortar education system and suddenly COVID happened and then we were forced to, you know, leverage the online learning model. And what that has done is that has given these entrepreneurs, these startups uh, to, you know, push beyond and, and ask deeper questions, you know, question the education model itself, you know. So today we, we, we have the, the internet plus the the brick and mortar education system, the, uh, the internet model, they have free education uh, in, in the form of MOOF, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Even India government has created the SWAM model which gives you education which is free. Now these edtech are constantly evolving, leveraging technology and creating more ways to, you know, create quality education with a very, very low price and at, at times completely free. And these tools such as artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, could completely democratize education in the ways artificial intelligence could create personalized education rather than these broad rote learning that we have today. It, it, it could go to a narrow learning which actually helps a, a student rather than being it broad based. And with uh, augmented reality, virtual reality or the metaverse, the school or the, uh, the college will come to 
the to your home to the student you know you won't have to step out because with these uh, ar vr glasses you will be able to be in a, a school or an institute and and learn from the from the teacher and, and so so there's some crazy things happening in the space of education you being the director uh, uh, of iit patna and now you're at iit bombay what's the dynamics that you you are seeing over there because i was having a conversation with the ex iit director of delhi and he was mentioning that it's getting more and more difficult for him to or any institutes to hold students in a classroom in a dynamic like this what do you think is the future of education what do you think possibly is going to be the future of education yeah so you know one thing is definite that this online uh, method of information transmission uh, delivery of educational material will remain okay and uh, there is a huge demand for uh, good teachers especially at the higher education sector so recording of teaching material and transmission of these recorded lectures is going to be reality okay students will definitely you know make use of these platforms and these content for their learning exercise now again uh, there is a belief which i have held for a long time uh, the information available on the internet recordings etc they give content they you know get, they give material but another very important part of teaching is inspiration you see you motivate the students now i have seen myself that when you touch the right points and uh, give show the ropes uh, show the vista show the path then students on their own st start moving in that direction traversing that path okay so we, they have to be motivated properly now uh, attendance in the class is becoming a problem but i also know that lots of people attend online and lots of students um, also watch the recordings and those those lectures so this is a reality which we will have to live with now to attract students to remain in the class at least in my field there is no reason why we cannot uh, make the teaching demonstration based so we ourselves in c field have created many uh, demonstrations uh, for example speech to speech translation you know i can show you a demonstration of english to marathi english to hindi speech to speech translation which is almost instant instantaneous so if you show it in the class the students get enthused they get connected also with the lecture material we have worked on movie script and plot generation so i have shown it in the class and the students have been very excited oh i mean none of these sentences are coming from human beings gpt3 is producing these sentences so we are they, they they get very excited by this then i take you know multilingual content like kannada marathi and the text to speech system utters them so flawlessly with proper emphasis good prosody and so on so in uh, in in classroom these demonstrations make a huge difference so that keep the students you know connected with the material but uh, this is may not be possible in all poss all courses for example highly theoretical fundamental courses may not be possible so here the uh, emphasis should be on very clear delivery of concepts lots of examples to be worked out so this is this is something i would like to quite uh, say quite uh, emphatically for foundational theoretical courses work out lots of examples for empirical uh, experimental practical courses give lots of demos so demo and example you know this is this should be the method of teaching yes sir i think the education industry itself is, is completely being upended you mentioned about the role of teachers now which are, are going to get more significant earlier it used to be the administrators who uh, or the institutes that would kind of you know take away everything but i think there is a larger uh movement where the student teacher interaction is where it's it's going towards and, and there are many platforms which are big, uh, creating these uh, uh, online models where a student can directly reach out to the teacher and I, 
believe that could be the model because with augmented reality virtual reality we will have experience based learning where it'll be exactly like how you experience learning right in the school you'll be able to touch feel things with these haptic feedback suits and these virtual reality glasses you'll be able to instead of talking about or making somebody experience something that okay about a place you could be in that physical place and you, know, you could actually touch feel possibly if you're doing a, a, a surgery you'll be able to kind of you know feel exactly a, so i think the experience based learning and artificial intelligence based personalized personalized learning i think could be the way towards where the education might go to now you mentioned about these uh, these tools such as gpt3 uh, i i are you uh, the institutes leveraging tools like gpt3 have you built applications using that besides uh, gpt3 yes. there, there are there are op, op, the open source platform like opt175 by uh, uh, meta and also bloom currently which has become a completely open yeah. source uh, large language model are, are you leveraging that in fs yes, have you Absolutely. built some tools uh, right, right. Uh, application so i mentioned to you i mentioned to you this uh, plot, movie plot and script generation system it is uh, based on gpt3 but of course we are now trying to all port it to bloom right now also our imprint question answering system which is supported by the knowledge graph we are trying to again port it to bloom and uh, the morphology analyzer is based on mt5 okay multilingual t5 system bart we are extensively using so yes we in our lab we are very very conversant with all these language models and not only that we try to compare and contrast these language models because the push is now towards less and less um, uh, parameter uh, based large language models where you can do with a smaller language model without appreciable degradation in the accuracy so you know this research is also quite strong now how to make use of language models which are smaller in weight and also there is this field of knowledge distillation distillation where you get a student model from the original model the original model is called the teacher model then you have a much smaller machine learning model with hardly any degradation in accuracy so all these move, you know movements are going on and we are very much uh, on top of all these developments in our lab would you like to talk a little bit more about the book cognitively inspired natural language processing yeah so this was the uh, this is a monograph which is based on the phd thesis of my student abhijit mishra dr abhijit mishra now i believe he is in apple in seattle so what happened was that we were observing this behavior that when uh, you know annotator annotated data and we have uh, done extensive work on sarcasm one of, one of my students was aditya joshi who did excellent work in this area he is now a a uh, researcher in uh, melbourne in australia so aditya's uh, phd thesis also was converted to a monograph uh, this is on uh, sarcasm detection sarcasm generation that that that, that area uh, translation transliteration was with uh, dr anup punchukutan who did his phd with me in this area so uh, your uh, question was on cognitive nlp so cognitive yeah. nlp is term we coined and we when we saw that you know understanding sarcasm requires uh, the cognitive process to be quite progressive regressive which is indicated by this i also the i moves forward hits a word and then comes back rapidly our favorite example in the lab is i love being ignored so that's a sarcastic sentence so i love love is a positive sentiment bearing word now you move forward what do you expect you expect this positive in sentiment to be reinforced or sustained but then you meet the wording so ignore has negative sentiment and you are surprised what is happening i saw a positive sentiment bearing word now there is a negative sentiment bearing word so you rapidly come back devote your attention to what you have seen before so this is the behavior of the eye and we and uh, we exploited this we said that for any kind kind of unusual language phenomenon like metaphor sarcasm humor etc we would like to make use of this eye signals and add them to the machine learning models input features to augment the performance and that indeed happens you know this kind of feature augmentation actually produces higher accuracy but all this work actually started with another motivation see that translators annotators they are paid uh, based on 
most of the time based on the number of words, the sentence length, for example. But that we believe is a very crude measure of payment because you take uh, this sentence, uh, John is in his house. And another sentence, John is in a soup. So the second statement requires much more cognitive load. You have it's a, met, it's a metaphorical statement. Okay, if some, how can somebody be in a soup? It indicates deep trouble. So here, cognitive load is much higher, and therefore the annotator or the evaluator has to be paid more money. So here, the length of the sentences, these two sentences are almost equal. But in the second case, you have to pay more. So that uh, can be captured by eye tracking behavior, which is an indicator of cognitive load. So there was a 1980 paper, absolutely seminal paper, which uh, um, established that men the mental load is uh, expressed by the eye tracking behavior. This is the eye mind hypothesis. The load on the mind is reflected in the behavior of the eye. So we base our work on that hypothesis and we propose that uh, capture eye tracking and then decide the payment for annotators and evaluators. So this was an ACL paper, which is the topmost uh, you know, NLP conferences. So uh, cognitive NLP started with rationalizing the compensation of annotators and evaluators based on their cognitive load indicated by eye tracking. And then we moved to usage of eye tracking and cognitive signals for more sophisticated NLP problems. You've been working on artificial intelligence for a long time and though artificial intelligence, I mean, it's creating real world applications now and is doing really, really cool things. It's still in a very, very narrow stage, though there's DeepMind's, uh, uh, DeepMind's uh, latest model, which is Gato. It, it's, it's supposed to be a multi-model, a multi-task, multi-embodiment generalist uh, policy agent. And it seems that the, the model can perform over 600 tasks. So what are your views on, uh, you know, artificial general intelligence? When do you think these uh, AI agents will be able to be a generalist uh, agent where it'll be able to do things which we humans do or what we call an artificial general intelligence? When do you think these artificial narrow intelligence where we are will move to you know artificial general intelligence and what would it need for us to build these artificial general intelligence model so you know, last year i was invited by sarn in geneva where uh, they have this very futuristic looking forum uh, discussing you know, how the world will move forward with respect to various science and technology and other developments. So this particular uh, meeting was devoted to, it's called Spark. It is devoted to uh, artificial intelligence. And there were, uh, you know, many panel discussions, brainstorming sessions and keynote speeches discussing the roadmap for AI. And AGI featured quite a lot in that uh, particular meeting. I think AGI is also called GI, right? General Artificial Intelligence or Artificial General Intelligence. So now this is, uh, by the way, uh, quite intuitive. So what do we see around ourselves? So uh, intelligent people are, uh, or people are, those people are called intelligent who are good at a number of things. Okay, for example, their reaction time is fast. Ask them some, uh, question and the questions can be of different types. The questions can be information seeking, questions can be analytic in nature, questions can be futuristic. Ask them any question, they first of all make sense and they also respond quickly. Okay, this is so uh, quick response time, I think, is an important sign of intelligence. So, but of course, that has to be properly correlated with the depth and quality of the answer. Because sometimes you may take more time, but give such a high quality answer and such a perspective changing answer, that also is a tremendous sign of intelligence. Now, we see that you know, for biological intelligence that we have muscle memory, muscle intelligence. We have in brain as the seat of intelligence, but intelligence is also in our uh, fingers and toes and rest of the body. That is what is said. 
and uh, indian uh, you know approach to philosophy consciousness etc has always believed in all pervading consciousness okay so those uh, can be understood only uh, with uh, a lot of sadhana a lot of uh, spiritual practice and refining our mind buddhi consciousness properly but art creating artificial general intelligence to my mind is not as mysterious as it is thought to be i think because we have done a lot of work on multitasking many of our papers are based on multimodality and multitasking especially in the area of sentiment and emotion analysis sarcasm for example in case of sarcasm i, I have collaborators and students uh, they have written papers from at patna and at bombay uh, on uh, multitask uh, sentiment emotion and sarcasm detection so in sarcasm we see that the signal comes from uh, both the picture and the image the tone and also the text so my one of my favorite examples yes you are a good man so this is an honest statement yes you are a good man so that would be a sarcastic statement okay so here the body language has been different so we have seen that when we do sarcasm detection along with emotion detection or emotion detection along with question answering or summarization with sentiment analysis then we have seen that both the individual tasks accuracy go up because we are doing these things together because these are related tasks so there is uh, no reason to you know to not see that computer vision task and language task speech task and vision task when they are performed together by the same entity they will assist each other and the accuracy of the performance will go up so applied general intelligence uh, you asked about the road map the road map really would be multilinguality multimodality and multitasking three ms will play their role in creating artificial general intelligence if you had to paint a picture of what the world would look like in the next 10 years you know with ai machine learning nlp could you kind of paint a picture you know what is sitting sitting in 2030 maybe what india could look like yeah so first of all india is a gold mine of data and uh, we are uh, gradually gradually moving in the right direction in in untapping this huge potential of data Aadhaar, for example, is a huge storehouse of data, huge amount of educational material in NPTEL, Swayam, huge amount of translation material in the form of, um, you know, tra translations in the e-commerce industry, in administration sector, judicial judicial sector. Everywhere, we see huge amount of data. So I'm quite certain that, you know, with uh, this uh, computing power. the uh, pro properly educate, educated and skilled manpower and with so much uh, data at our disposal india will be a strong force to reckon definitely in ai field so i have i have been i have always believed in this that if i am working in ai i should be in india okay because of the huge number of beautiful problems huge amount of data this is the right place to be in for ai so in 2030 in 10 years india will be a big leader and big powerhouse in artificial intelligence i'm quite certain about this there there are so many great things happening i, I my only hope is, is that we we such a huge nation you know i think you know the the like you mentioned you know we we've taken all the right steps you know with the education the swayam model with the id the aadhar uh, all this needs to possibly come together it needs to bind together and 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 i guess all the institutes instead of working in silos needs to come together and collaborate because i guess the the reason i think we 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 came out with a vaccine in 6 months which normally takes around 4 to 6 years is is only and only because of collaboration and today i think we are we we are uh, at the cusp of seeing some really great application in real world application because for the longest time we've been saying saying ai is going to do this ai is going to do that with hardly any real world benefits or application but we are seeing that but i guess if we all collaborate if the industry the academia the government if it all joins hand i i 
think you know we'll be able to create applications which will touch not just those privileged lot which sits in the urban areas but also in, in the rural areas giving them education giving them health care and, and you know business opportunities also because that's what ai can do it's got so much potential you are sitting at the right place creating some really really awesome things sir so please keep on doing what you're doing and thank you for sharing your insights and foresights on ai we wish you the very best and to my listeners if you like what you see in here then please press the subscribe button until next time see you guys thank you sir really appreciate this